Sometimes you ever find yourself in a situation, maybe you thought God wanted you to do it, or God's called you or led you to a place or a position or a, or a dream that you feel like, boy, one of these days I'd love to get there, or you had a, had a promise, but then it just doesn't seem to be working out and you feel like quitting. How many of you ever just felt like, I'm, I'm done, <laughs> had enough? That's what I want to share with you today about don't quit on the sixth day. You know, God gave Abraham a promise that he would be a father of a new nation. And that's quite a promise given to a couple with no children. So years went by. They waited and they waited and they waited. No child was born to them. The couple got impatient. So they decided to take matters into their own hands. Sarah offered her maid Hagar to her husband, and they had a son, named him Ishmael. And more more years went by, and Sarah got up to be around 90 years old, and Abraham had just had his 100th birthday. And they had given up and assumed that Ishmael was the son that God had promised them that would become the great nation of promise that God had given him. But then in Genesis chapter 18, God says to Abraham and Sarah, he says, in due season, you will have a child. And I'm sure Abraham responded, "Uh, God, have you noticed we already have one? His name is Ishmael. And God says, oh no, that's not the one that I'm talking about here. Abraham was 100 years old and his wife was 90. Do you think that Abraham had some doubts? Do you think that waiting until he was 100 years old for God to fulfill the promise, making him wait so long, year after year, do you think that's strange? Do you think that had to be a little bit frustrating for Abraham? Well, decades became centuries, and the children of Abraham had not yet arrived to the land that had been promised to them centuries before. The promise was beginning to look bleak, they were slaves in Egypt. I mean, if you're going to go to the promised land and, you're, and you've been a slave for four centuries, it just doesn't look like you're making much progress in the promise that God had given you. I think their perspective probably was somewhat obstructed. The promise seemed out of reach. It wasn't happening anytime soon. It didn't look like. But then by the time Joshua chapter 6 rolls around, they had made progress. The children of Israel are literally right at the doorway of the promised land. They're at Jericho. And after 40 years of wandering in the desert, a long trip from Egypt, they finally arrived to the gateway of the promised land, to the city Jericho. Now Jericho was a military fortress guarding the eastern passageway to the promised land. I guess it was like the main highway into what is now Israel. And Israelites could not pass the military garrison in Jericho. They had to take the city because they could not afford to have Jericho's troops at their back. So the city had to be taken. But their perspective was obstructed, once again, because Jericho was a walled city with a big, tall, thick wall. They had literally run into a wall on their way to the Promised Land. Have you ever had a dream or a promise or a vision or a hope, but then run into a wall and it doesn't look like, oh man, I've made it so far, but all of a sudden I've hit a wall and I can't break through. Happens to a lot of us. God had brought them to the front door of the promised land, but they immediately hit a wall. Sometimes what God says is not what actually takes place. God told Joshua, if you look at chapter 6, verse 2, listen to what he says to Joshua. He says, the Lord said to Joshua, I have handed Jericho over to you along with its king and its soldiers. Now, what God just says to Joshua doesn't really look like reality. I mean, can you imagine Joshua standing there looking at this big walled city of Jericho and God speaks to him and says, I've already given them to you. 
uh, could cause a little bit of doubt there. Walled cities were not easy to conquer. You had to lay siege for months, for years. And as long as the food and water held out inside the city, there wasn't much hope of you knocking down the big thick walls. Walls kept you out. And these walls of Jericho were keeping them out of the promised land. So in case the enemy was keeping them out, blocking their entrance, it was discouraging to them. But God said to Jericho, don't worry, they're already yours. This is where faith has to start kicking in. You can look at the walls or you can listen to what God says. Thankfully, Joshua was a man of faith. You know, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 17 that if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to a mountain, move, and it'll move. You know, doesn't that really sound nice? <laughs> but then when you look at a mustard seed and you look at a mountain, it's kind of like, okay, a mustard seed, mountain, I don't know, Lord. It makes a good verse to quote when you're discouraged. But I think the point Jesus is making here is you have to look to God and not at the big mountain or the problem. And that's what Joshua had to do. He had to look and hear, look to God and hear the voice of God instead of looking at the walls because the walls looked daunting. He, they had literally hit a wall on their way to the promised land. So your perspective is critical when progress isn't obvious, when things appear to get worse instead of better, when the enemy attacks you and tries to discourage you, don't give up. Listen to God's plan. Now, God told Joshua that the city and the king and all the soldiers inside belong to him. And then he tells Joshua how this is going to happen. Now, keep in mind, he only says this to Joshua. He didn't make a public announcement to all the people of Israel. So in Genesis, I'm not Genesis, but Joshua chapter 6, verses 3 through 6, God gives Joshua his plan on how this is going to happen. He says, you shall march around the city, all the warriors circling the city once. Thus, you shall do this for six days. So God just says, first thing you're going to do is you're going to gather all your troops and you're going to walk around the city one time per day. And then it goes on to say, in verse 4, with seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark, on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests blowing their trumpets. When they make a long blast with the, with the ram's horn, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with great shout, and the wall of the city will fall flat, and the people shall charge straight in. So God has told Joshua the plan. It's important to discern and listen to the voice of God. When, you're, when God gives you a vision and a dream, or <clears throat> if you're working towards a goal that is uh, given to you by God, make sure you listen to his voice. Taking matters in your own hands can be very risky, can get you off track. Can you imagine what would have happened if Joshua would have said, okay, God, I heard your plan. I don't really like it. I'd rather do my plan. <laughs> now, he didn't do that. He listened to the voice of God. God revealed his plan to Joshua, but no one else. So put yourself in the, in the place of an average Israelite soldier. He doesn't really know what the strategy is. He doesn't know what the plan is. All he does is do what he's told to do. So each day the soldiers were told to march around the city one time. They were told not to talk, to keep quiet. You ever wonder what they were thinking in the morning when they got up? Warrior got up, put on his armor, his shield, his spear, his sword, falls into battle formation with thousands of other troops, and the command is given, everyone, march around the city. So all the soldiers march around the city. It takes maybe about an hour and a half to march around the city of Jericho. And when they get back to the staging area, the commander, Joshua, says, all right, you're dismissed for the day. They go home to his wife. And she says to the soldier as he walks into his tent, 
how did your day go, honey? <laughs> well, we walked around the city of Jericho. Well, what happened? Nothing. <laughs> a few people waved at us from the top of the walls, but nothing happened. Day two, day three, day four, the same old story. Put on the armor, fall into formation, walk around the city, dismiss for the day. Go eat breakfast, guys. Comes home to his wife, how'd your day go today, honey? Well, the same as the last few days. By day five, he's probably bewildered. And she, he comes home on the fifth day after walking around the city. And his wife said, how'd your day go? And he says, you know what? Joshua's crazy. He's wasting our time. We've walked around this city five times and not one brick has even fallen out of the wall. And nevertheless, all the people on the fan on the wall are laughing at us, shouting at us, making fun of us. This is ridiculous. You know, on the sixth day, the warriors could have just said, I'm not going to walk around that city one more time. This is ridiculous. This is a waste of time. We're spinning our wheels. We're going nowhere. How are we going to conquer this city by walking around it one time a day? Sometimes the process of a journey seems open-ended. Have you ever felt that? You know, you've got something, a goal laying out there, something you want to achieve, maybe something God's put on your heart, but you just don't know how long it's going to take. You know, there's no, it's open-ended. I remember when I was in high school playing sports, the coaches always used to make us run wind sprints. How many of you guys know what wind sprints are? It's you run 30 or 40 yards, turn around, and run right back. Now, if the coach told me I was going to do it 10 times, I could handle it. Or if he told me I was going to do it 20 times, I could handle it. Because I'd say, okay, when I get up to 10, I'm halfway through. I go, all I got to do is do 10 more. But oftentimes, they would not say how many we had to do. And you know what? That caused me lots of anxiety. Because <laughs> I would run back and forth or run back and forth, and you did not know how much longer. And you had to pace. You couldn't pace yourself. You didn't know if you were going to run 50 or 20. And, you know, I just, I hate an open-endedness. You didn't know how long it was going to take, the, the people of Israel during that time at Jericho. It could have taken weeks, could have taken months, could have taken a year. Well, look how long Abraham had to wait. God told him that he was going to have a child, and decades went by. He was 100 years old. That was open-ended. How, how many more days do we have to march around this city? How many more days do we have to spin our wheels? I guess some advice that you could get from this story is don't quit on the sixth day, right? No matter how futile, no matter how frustrating or discouraging it might be. So they got up, they put on their armor, they got ready for battle, and they walked around the city of Jericho on day six. They didn't quit. Thinking, no doubt, how much longer do we have to do this? Why are we doing this? Didn't make a lot of sense. But, the next day they got up, they put on their armor, they got ready for battle, and this day they received new orders from Joshua. They were to walk around the city not one time, but seven times. And on the seventh time, the priests would blow the trumpets and everyone would shout at the top of their lungs. And they, was, they, were, they were told to do that, and they were wondering, okay, what's going to happen? How do you huff and puff and blow the walls down? <laughs> So they did exactly as they were ordered. God had told Joshua what to do. Joshua relayed the orders to the troops. They marched around the city seven times. They blew the trumpets. They shouted, and the wall came tumbling down. They took the city, and they immediately moved into the promised land. So the lesson we learn from this story today is don't quit on the sixth day. You might be on the sixth day in your life. You might be in a situation where your life is on hold, it seems like. You're not making any progress. You're tired, you're frustrated, you're discouraged. Your patience may have run out. I don't know, maybe it could be your career, your finances, your kids, relationships in your life. It just doesn't seem like you're going anywhere. You've hit a wall. 
But I would encourage you to don't quit. Because you might be on the sixth day. And you may not realize that the seventh day is just around the corner. Even though there may not look like a solution in sight, don't quit on the sixth day. Because that seventh day is coming. Don't stop. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Let's pray, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to keep our hearts always encouraged. So easy to get frustrated. It's so easy to give up. So easy to quit. But Lord, you haven't called us to quit. You've given people in this church a dream, a hope. You've given us goals. Sometimes, Lord, we might find ourselves in a situation where circumstances don't look well. It could be our relationship. It could be our finances. It could be our, our children. And sometimes, Lord, it just doesn't look like they're, they're ever going to turn around. It doesn't look like the situation is ever going to get any better. But, Lord, help us to always remember to listen to your voice, to hear your instructions, and to not give up. So, Lord, keep us strong, keep us faithful, and keep our ears open to what you would have us to do. And we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.